Hi everyone, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs. Forgive me YouTube for I have sinned. And in this video, I'd like to confess to my five worst photography habits. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, at Camera Labs, by the way, um, you could argue that I have considerably more than five bad photography habits, but I wanted to talk about the five that I've consistently stuck to throughout my life as a photographer. The ones that just keep coming back. Those are the really bad habits. The ones that are so deeply ingrained you just can't get rid of them. But hopefully by confessing to them, the shame will help me move forward. And maybe if you suffer from them too, you could go, do you know what? Maybe it's time for me to move on as well. And if you have got five or even three or four, however many bad photography habits, please let us know in the comments so that we can all shame, I mean, learn from each other. Okay, let's get on with it. Okay, bad habit number one is not leaving enough space around your subject for them to breathe. Now, the reason this is a problem, particularly if your subject is in motion, is because it's so easy to crop a bit of that subject off the edge of the frame. Imagine you're taking pictures of people playing sports and you've captured this fantastic moment of somebody heading a football or hitting a tennis ball or just jumping in a really spectacular fashion but it's spoiled because their hands or legs or even part of their head is cropped off the frame. Or even if the subject, the main subject, is comfortably within the frame, maybe the reaction of someone around them has been cropped. And you look at that and you think, cool, that picture would have been so much better if I'd just captured a slightly wider field of view. And it's this obsession that I've got to try and fill the frame fill the frame with the subject in order to devote the most number of pixels to it and maximize the quality. Now, this is a kind of historical bad habit, as many bad habits are, they were formed a long time ago. When I first started with digital photography, I was testing cameras not even with one megapixel. They started off with a third of a megapixel, 640 by 480 pixels. Now, if your subject didn't fill the frame in those days, then you would end up after cropping with something that looked like, uh, you know, a sprite from Super Mario back in the 8-bit days. So I would always try and get into the habit of maximizing the size of the subjects on the frame to maximize the quality. But these days with entry-level cameras and even phones offering 24 megapixels or more and higher-end cameras really exceeding 50 megapixels in some cases, there's just no excuse not to leave some space around the subject. You can crop in later and still have plenty of room. So that's my first bad habit, leave more space around the subject. Let them breathe. Don't chop off any more limbs. Okay, my second worst photography habit. These aren't in any particular order, by the way. But the second that I'm gonna mention in this video is obsessively choosing low ISOs, again, to maximize the quality. Now, the problem with shooting at low ISOs, especially if you're based where I am, where the light levels are not always particularly bright, is that the camera has to obviously compensate with a different kind of exposure. It could be using a shutter speed that's a bit slower than you can confidently handhold and therefore running into camera shake. It could be selecting an aperture that's probably possibly wider open than you'd like it to be, resulting in a very shallow depth of field. And I'll come on to that one as its own separate bad habit in just a moment. So the problem is you could end up with a picture that's not sufficiently in focus or a picture that's spoiled by camera shake. And for what? just in order to shoot at 100 or 200 ISO. Now, again, historically, I would do this because back in the day, 100 ISO or 200 ISO was about as far as you wanted to take those cameras. If you were shooting at four or 800, you'd often suffer from really bad image quality, but that is just no longer the case. If you bought a camera in the past couple of years, you'll probably find that it looks fantastic at 800, 1600, maybe even 3200 ISO, or higher. So embrace those higher ISOs. Sure, if you do want the best quality and you're, say, shooting from a tripod or understand the risks, go ahead, shoot at the lowest values. You'll still get the best possible quality. But shooting at 400 or 800 or even a stop or two higher on most modern cameras is not gonna be that big an issue. And believe me, a little bit of noise is way better than having camera shake or too shallow a depth of field. Bad habit number three, having too shallow a depth of field. Now, I love bokeh blobs as much as the next man, <laughs> maybe a little bit more. And in my job testing cameras and lenses, I love seeing how far I can push those shallow depth of field effects, but it can often be detrimental to the final result, can't it? If you don't have enough in focus, you can't actually see 
what the subject's supposed to be. And unless you're doing some sort of abstract type of photography, well, then that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? It can happen on portraits, most typically. You choose that maximum aperture value for the ultimate blurring in the background, but you find that the ears are not in focus, the nose isn't in focus, or my worst particular bugbear is both eyes aren't in focus. It just doesn't look right on a portrait, and it equally applies to video. It also applies when you're photographing static subjects. I do, as you know, obviously a lot of product reviews and I like those shallow depth of field effects in order to deliver a stylish result. But if you can't see what I'm talking about, if you can't see what's written on that mode dial or on the back of the screen, then it is pretty distracting. And I apologize for all of the times that I've done that, where I've chased those blurring effects. And the reason that we do it is partly because it's in fashion now partly because wide aperture lenses are more popular and common than they've ever been, and also because the technology that drives them, the autofocus systems on modern cameras, can absolutely nail the focus at very, very shallow depth of fields. And really good cameras can also track focus during video, again with shallow depth of field effects. So the temptation when you're filming video or shooting portraits is to go for that really, really super blurry background and say, hey, look at my amazing camera technology. It can keep me sharp even when everything around me is blurred, but it doesn't always look great, does it? So like any special effects or unusual effects, use them with caution, use them sparingly. They can look really good, they can be very effective, but they're not for every occasion. And there's also very much an element of being comfortable with shooting at smaller apertures for a larger depth of field. I've been in portrait sessions with lots of other photographers and you can spot the inexperienced portrait photographers like me and Milof because we're all choosing the maximum apertures, the f1.4s, f1.2s and going, wow, look at this effect. Meanwhile, the more experienced ones are comfortably shooting at f4, f5, 6 or even f8 and going, hey, look at the detail that I'm capturing and both my eyes are in focus. So be at peace with closing that aperture when you need to and opening it when you'd like to. Okay, bad habit number four is relying on auto white balance. And bonus points if you also shoot in JPEG where that white balance is baked forever into that file and almost impossible to correct for. This is particularly a problem I find when shooting under artificial light where the camera may not meter the white balance properly and end up uh, giving your picture a bluish or a greenish or an orangish tint. That might be what you're after, but probably isn't. The solution to this, because it is very hard to correct on a JPEG once it's baked in, is to shoot in RAW or to shoot in RAW plus JPEG, which I do for the most flexibility. Because if the JPEG works out fine, brilliant. If it doesn't, then you've got that RAW file upon which it is very easy to adjust the white balance. And in fact, it can be really fun to try different white balance settings on a RAW file and see which ones you prefer, because it can be used to a really nice creative effect. Now, in my defense, I do rely on auto white balance more than I should do, simply because it does work pretty well most of the time. Uh, it really does depend on the camera that you've got. Some do it much better than others. So, as always, it's a case of learning your equipment, knowing what works best for you, also the kind of situations you shoot in. You know, a lot of the times that I'm doing my own personal photography, it's under daylight conditions, at which point most auto white balance settings will get it right. But if you're shooting in more challenging conditions, then I urge you to take control of your white balance. Or again, better still, shoot in RAW plus JPEG to give you that flexibility should things go wrong. And on to my fifth and final worst habit, or at least the uh, fifth one that I'm going to confess to in this video. And it's so simple, it's so fundamental, I'm embarrassed to even say it, but let's go ahead with it. And that is going out with a memory card that you've perhaps not completely checked is got much space remaining on it. Now, in my defense, I test a lot of cameras, often to exhaustion, not just my own personal exhaustion, but where I'll put a card in, and I'll keep shooting still pictures until it runs out of memory or battery or keep recording video until it runs out of uh, power or it overheats. And as a consequence, most of my memory cards are completely full up. And I'm also 
you know, a little bit paranoid about reformatting those straight away because they contain the information that you want. Sure, of course, I copy them onto my computer, which in turn backs up onto network storage and cloud storage. Beyond that, I do have backups all the time. But there is something about pressing that format button in your camera that really, you know, makes you feel a little bit anxious, right? So often I leave those cameras full of images and video, which means inevitably when I go out shooting, I, I'm stuck thinking, oh no, I've only got space for a couple of pictures or a minute or two of video, and I have to start going through it and individually deleting images. Did I back that one up? Is it important? Do I need it as a spare? So this is more a habit of management. Have good memory management, good file management. Have a system where when you come back from a shoot, you back up your photos, you know that they're always in the right places so that you can confidently reformat those cards. Because, dear viewers, when you are switching cards around, if you want to practice safe card switching, then you should really reformat those cards. Because if you don't and you put them in a different type of camera, then often you can have some file issues. So those are my five bad habits. Okay, I've moved indoors for this final segment because it was getting a little bit blustery out there on that cold winter's morning on the Brighton seafront and the little Rode Wireless Go microphone that I was using to record those outdoor segments. Well, if you can't get that little wind muffler on it, and I couldn't because it kept blowing off, then it's not particularly good under windy conditions. You get that kind of sound in the background. So I apologize for that, but it's just more excuses, isn't it? Maybe that could be my first bad habit in a future video for videography or vlogging bad habits. Let me know if you'd like to see that. But in the meantime, let's wrap up this one on bad habits or my own bad habits for photography. And saying them all out loud made me really realize that at least two or three of them were based on compensating for the deficiencies of older technology on older cameras, trying to maximize the resolution in your pictures, trying to minimize the ISO sensitivity for the best quality. These are all things that were important maybe 10 or 20 years ago, but which just aren't issues today in 2020 or going forward. And it reminds me of something that I say to a lot of photographers, especially photographers who are switching types of cameras, say from DSLRs to mirrorless, and they're looking at electronic viewfinders and the way they work, and they try and adapt the new camera to work like their old one. I mean, it's not surprising. It's what we all do. We've got something that we're very comfortable with, and so we try and bend new technology to work like the old ones. But when you do that, you're not making the most of that new technology. You really do need to relearn how to shoot with these cameras. Now, of course, all of the traditional stuff, aperture, shutter speed, composition, lighting, timing, all of that still applies to all cameras but I'd urge you and urge myself to really adopt and embrace new technologies learn how they can work for you and hopefully get rid of some of those old bad habits so that's what I've taken out of this what did you learn did you watch this video and think hey you know what I do some of that too maybe I could change or did you look and think do you know what this guy so anyway I want to hear what your five worst habits in photography are so put them in the comments below and that only leaves me to make a really unapologetic bit of product placement with this the camera labs mug it really does make all of your beverages taste that much better links in the comments and the description below cheers mm, truly delicious